After a modest start in Canadian television, Montreal-born Jay Baruchel got his big Hollywood break in the early 2000s at the age of 18. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, we're like having a party tonight. Do you like want to come? His work in the groundbreaking comedy Undeclared led to a number of blockbuster roles. You know what your problem is, Kirk? What? You're a moodle. A moodle? A man poodle. He became an in-demand character actor, but never felt comfortable in Hollywood. So Baruchel returned home, where his passion for the Habs is matched only by his desire to tell Canadian stories on film. And it doesn't get any more Canadian than his latest role as the inventor of the Blackberry. That guy is sketchy. I don't think he's sketchy. It's an unorthodox career path for an actor and filmmaker who literally wears the maple leaf over his heart. So you were, what, maybe 18 years old and you moved to Los Angeles, yeah. to Hollywood, to work on a program with, with Seth Rogen, Judd Apatow, Jason Segel. Yeah. What was that like? It's crazy, man. <laughs> it's like all of my friends uh, were spending money to go and uh, go to university and I was getting paid to pretend that I was. <laughs> <laughs> it was sick. It was the best. I was 18. It's my first time living alone, um, and it's there, you know. It, it's, it wasn't like Sarnia. Like, I, I, my first time was I like, living in, in, in Hollywood, literally, in, mm -hmm. in, 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 like, West Hollywood and, and shit. Um, I was very lucky. A lot of people have it far worse than me. I need to stress that. Uh, but at the same time, I could never call it easy, uh, you know. And um, the fact that I came out of that era without any sort of, like, crippling addictions or, or, or um, let's say, inconvenient mental issues. All, all of my mental issues are manageable. <laughs> so, 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 like, I don't know how. I, I do. My mom raised me right, and I, you know, was surrounded by pretty good people. But, uh, but boy, it could have gone, it could have gone either way. Also, you had the benefit of CBC News World. Yes, I did. I oh. read that you... <laughs> It's true, yeah. though. You, you had a cable <laughs> system that, that got much music and, 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 and News World. World yeah. and, and that was for an 18-year-old kid who couldn't drive in Los Angeles. I lived and was feeling it. lonely. Yeah, it saved me. We were your lifeline. You, you, you joke. You bring it up with your tongue near your cheek. But I swear to God, man, like that was like a big, that was a big thing. That was the only channels that I had. Those are the only channels I had on in my apartment. Hosted by frontline journalists Joe Schlesinger and Ian Hanamansing on News World International. I have always been someone who gets homesick super easy. I was always the kid that would like uh, call my parents from a sleepover right before it was bedtime. We were watching movies, it was fine. We were eating pizza, it was fine. When it was time to go to bed, I would lose my shit and I'd always have to call dad to come and rescue me. Wow. You know, and so to me, it's not crazy that I had a version of that down there. Um, and so I just like made my little piece of Hollywood sovereign Canadian soil. And so when you would come into my apartment, yeah, there'd be a big Canadian flag on the wall and news world would be on. You wrote a, a fantastic book, Thank you. Uh, which made me laugh out loud, even as you talked about the, the trauma within your family yes. and, and your difficult uh, relationship with your dad, who you describe as, as having been uh, an addict yeah. and, and died young and died after being estranged from you. Um, how much does that relationship shape who you turned out to be? At least 50% uh, of who I am is because of that. Uh, um, it, hard, hard not to, like, um, for, for better or worse, you know. Um, I think, like, my dad, for me, was as much um, uh, a cautionary tale as a sort of uh, inspiration. No, not as much. I'll say, let's go, let's go 70 cautionary, 30 inspired. <laughs> <laughs> inspiring. Because uh, he was dead. My father was a, was a garbage fire. I never once saw my father sober. I have no idea what that looks like, you know, um, because he was like, he was frigged from about 11 a.m. every single day. 
and he's popping a lot of pills and still blowing rails and all this stuff, like ugly shit. So the, the good part of that is um, when you grow up in the like third act of Goodfellas, <laughs> when, when, when it's just paranoia and uh, clammy, pallid skin and, uh, and irritability and uh, it, that, that hard drugs lose their kind of sex, their allure, right? So I, to this day, um, uh, have never tried cocaine. I've never tried half of the shit my dad did because uh, out of either fear of being him, but also just like it never seemed appealing. He also is, to his credit, he, he's part of why I'm still in this kind of world because it, it, he would rent a movie every Friday and Saturday night and I'd wake up early the next morning, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, and if the tape was still in the VCR, that meant that, oh, mom and dad think I'm allowed, I'm okay, it's okay for me to watch. If it was back in this case, it was like sort of too racy for me. So this meant that dad fed me movies and often with a sort of like 101 course before it of why this movie is good, why he liked it, his memory seeing it the first time. My father really, just wanted me to have a thing I cared about. And his dad never went to a single one of his hockey games, his entire, wow. the entire time he played hockey. And so he was like, he had it in his mind that no matter what, I'm not gonna be that. And so if my kid likes movies, I'm gonna lean into that. So he bought me movie books every single Christmas. He always just bought me books about movies. Sometimes it was the Leonard Malton guide. Sometimes it was literally the in-house like buyer's catalog that a video store would have when there was time, come time for them to order next month's movies. And he would just be like, what can I give you for that? Because my kid will read it. The politics and the history of this country really seem to have had an impact on you, like being an Anglo, Montrealer yeah. during the referendum debate in 1995. Yeah, that was an interesting, uh, very colorful time. Canada without Quebec, it's no more Canada. And Quebec without Canada, it's no more Quebec. It was especially a odd one for me because uh, we, we moved to the GTA uh, when I was like five, when we lived in a place called Oshawa, and then we moved back to Montreal in the winter of 93. And so being dropped there at that particular time when you know you, you, you not only had sort of um, Quebec nationalist kind of fervor kicking up, it was also uh, a pretty rough time economically in our country. And so it was just a um, very vivid time. The country has been brought to the brink. Everything was very close to the nerve, you know. And so you're a guy who, who talks about Montreal a lot, who loves having been from Montreal, but you live here in Toronto. Yeah. What's up with that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the great kind of uh, things I had to accept in my life was that um, I quite like it here. And in particular, a lot of Anglo-Montrealers are, are sort of raised with a kind of... Um, anti-Toronto, in, in, in the sort of cult of anti-Torontoness. And, and Vancouver has that to an extent as well. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, but not like Montreal. It, it's, it's ancient. It goes back to the foundation of this country. My mom always said to me that we are um, sort of a different breed. We are, we're, we're Montreal Anglos. There's only, there's only, it's a very select, specific community in the world. Uh, you know. And I would only come in here for like four or five days at a time during like TIFF. And so my uh, experience of the city was sort of limited to one very specific part of Toronto during a very specific part of the year. Then working here, I did a movie here uh, in like 2012, I think, and I had to spend a bunch of time here. And I was like, oh, I think this suits me. And I had like a lot of friends here and it was just like kind of easy being here. Um, and then it, I came to the conclusion, which is just like, um, for, for better or worse, I want to uh, work and create in Canadian cinema um, for, for as long as I can. And, and if I want to create in Canada and my ideas are in English, well then it behooves me to be here. 
And then I, you know, I met my wife, and she's from here, and her, all of her family are here, and I moved my mom here, and now my sister and, and her husband and, and their kid are here too, and so we're all now back in the same city, it's just a different city, and if you told any of us 10 years ago that it would be Toronto, I think we'd all play to go jump in the fucking lake. Stop talking! Listen up! So Adrian, can you give us like the sort of final third of his trajectory leading up to the hit? That's what we're gonna cover on John. So, Canadian guy, you, you've done a couple of movies about a hockey enforcer, Goon, now Blackberry, and I kind of feel like, you know, trilogies are nice. So years from now, people should look back at, at the Jay Baruchel Canadian trilogy. <laughs> so you need to do one more, one yes. more topic. I, I, what what would know. that be? Oh boy, I, that's so nice of you to ask, and you're going to regret asking. <laughs> uh, um, Is it about me? I, <laughs> Ian, exclamation mark, is a sort of uh, musical about a uh, rookie cub reporter fighting his way through the Halifax, CBC Halifax newsroom. Exactly, and I like that. <laughs> that works for me. Um, all, all I want to do is immortalize to romanticize without glorifying Canadian stories. I, I think that, you know, in English Canada, it's something that we have historically not been great at. Yep. For, for good, honorable reasons, because I think that, like, we inherit a sort of um, stiff upper lip from the Brits, uh, but we're also raised next to the crucible of, a, of Americana. It's a very condescending, patronizing thing that we do to ourselves where we don't want to be like them, and we don't want, we're not the fireworks people. So, so the cost of that is that if you go down on the street corner, um, all of these kind of flashpoints of, of Canadian history that in a lot of other countries would be part of the, the sort of uh, origin myth of that country, mm -hmm. people don't know. There are people out there that won't know what the Halifax explosion is. There yep. are people that, you know, I, I, I could go on. There's a whole, a whole bunch of people out there who, who probably know the name Vimy Ridge but don't know what happened there. They know the name Billy Bishop because there's an airport, but they don't know why we named an airport after him. Uh, Darcy McGee, there's like, you know, anyway, so I want to spend my entire career telling Canadian stories and, and making them part of our kind of uh, common cultural tapestry because um, there, there is some fascinating shit that has happened here, just like in any other country, um, and it's okay to admit that, and by admitting that, you're not necessarily um, qualifying it. You don't have to say it's good or bad, it's just interesting and it happened. And so where does the Blackberry movie fit in all of that? So the story of Blackberry, of these kind of Canadian nerds who, um, you know, tried to innovate in earnest and sort of had a sort of cockeyed, good faith approach to uh, entrepreneurship, ultimately get ruined by the monster of laissez-faire capitalism. And I think that is something that can resonate throughout this country. So I, I think that Blackberry is an important Canadian story um, because, uh, number one, it sets the table for the world that we live in now, the way that we relate to one another, the way that uh, news is disseminated, the way that uh, families um, sort of know each other, the way the world understands each other, the way that elections are won and lost is in large part on a device in your hand. Mm -hmm. And that is something that some nerds in Waterloo created. They are not household names. Okay. Uh, what, um 25% uh, for 250,000. 50% for 50 bucks. 33% for 125,000 and you can run the company with me. Mike, no, no! We yes, can... deal, deal. So toiling in anonymity, but creating such an important thing to, to sort of global culture, what's more Canadian than that? Well, when you're ready to do Ian exclamation mark, give me a call. You got it. Done and <laughs> done. Right. Real pleasure Thank talking to you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>